Howdy and Happy New Year. Wow, 2023 is here. We are so excited that we could be together, whether together in person or virtually, that we may worship the Lord our God. Our first hymn for 2023 is Sweet Hour of Prayer. The call to worship this morning comes from Grace Watkins. I will read the light print. I'll ask you to respond in the bold. After the star and its golden ray, after the child in the manger bed, the wise man journeyed a different way with new horizons shining ahead. It is for us as it was for them. The star is gold and the child is sweet. And once we have traveled to Bethlehem, we lift our eyes and we turn our feet to roads that we never saw before, glory companion forevermore. Please join me in the prayer of the day. O oh God, who by the shining of a star did guide the wise man to behold thy son our Lord, Show us your heavenly light and give us grace to follow until we find him and finding him rejoice. And grant that as they presented gold, frankincense, and myrrh, we now may bring him the offering of a loving heart, an adoring spirit, and an obedient will for his honor and for your glory, O God most high. Amen. Our next hymn this morning is I Surrender All.
January 1st is usually a day of uh, New Year's resolutions. May our resolution this year be one of prayer, daily prayer, asking God for guidance to use us to be his servant in this world of great need and great pain. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, you have exalted Jesus over all creation to lead us into truth. Receive the prayers we offer in his name as we begin this year. Give us wisdom to resist the earthly powers that seek to destroy the fabric of society. And may we all be guided in the way of peace. Bring unity of mission to your church and fill us with a joy of your gospel as we invite others into your kingdom. In full all who suffer in mind, body, or soul into the comfort of your healing and enable us to extend our arms in kindness as witness to your love. Eternal God, our beginning and our end, we remember those who are dying and who have died. May they know the joy of your never-ending realm of peace. Sovereign God, you sent Jesus to begin your kingdom in a world of justice and peace through the power of your spirit. May the words we pray this day and for the next 364 days of this year be more than words. Use us, O Lord and let our lives reveal your love. These things we pray in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught his disciples when they prayed to say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On this, the first Sunday after Christmas and the first Sunday of the new year, the normal Christmas passage comes from Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at the rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him in Bethlehem, of Judea, for it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they sent out, and there ahead of them went the star as they had seen it as it's rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. And on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered them gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road.
last week when my family was together in Portland, we drove around and looked at the Christmas lights. At one home, there on the front lawn was a typical manger scene with Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus, with the shepherds and some sheep, kind of like what we have here on the altar, kind of the crash scene. And then across, over on the side, across the driveway, were the magi, the wise men, and a camel. And I thought, this family has the Christmas story down. Too often the wise men are plucked down with everyone else, but they really aren't. They're not at the major, but rather Matthew records that they entered a house, probably a home of Joseph's extended family. Matthew is a little skimpy on the details other than the name of the three gifts that were given to honor Jesus. We really don't know how many actually made the trip. We know that it was they and there, so no, it was more than one, but two, three, four, a dozen? It was sometime in the sixth century that the church gave these magi names. Gaspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. So by naming them, they also set the number at three, which is traditionally held by the Western or Roman church. In the Eastern or Orthodox church, the number actually is 12. So we in the West have come to embrace the symmetry of three gifts and three wise men. I wanted to learn more about the Magi, so I had to go outside of Scripture. Some thought that the Magi were astrologers who looked at the stars to come up with something like horoscopes. Others thought they were astronomers who looked at the stars for scientific purposes. Up until what the Polish astronomer uh, Copernicus wrote in the 16th century, astrologers thought that the earth was the center of the universe and that human action was controlled by the stars. If you read, if you read Julius Caesar in English class in high school, you might remember Cassius saying, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. So maybe the Magi were scientists looking for truth. One title I do not try, that I do try to stay away from, is calling these guys wise men. I'm not sure how wise they really were. Scripture informs us that they gave away Jesus' location to King Herod. And after the Magi did not report back to Herod, after going to Jerusalem, to Bethlehem, Herod sent his hit squad to find out this new king of the Jews. Or maybe the Magi could have been religious folk, like practicing the, the Persian religion of Zoroastrianism. So we really don't know a lot about the Magi from Scripture. We don't know exactly where they came, traveled from. We assume Persia or Babylon, which is modern day Iraq. So by the time of our Lord's birth, Jews had lived in Babylon for close to 600 years. And all we have is speculation at best with no evidence to support that these Magi were actually Jews themselves. If they had and had been learned Jews, then they would have known of Micah's prophecy that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem and would never have had to go to see King Herod for directions or guidance of where the Christ child was born. 
So it seems that announcing Christ's birth this way, that God crossed cultural and religious boundaries, as well as social and geographical, to proclaim news to the entire world of his great love in the birth of the baby Jesus, who would be the savior to all. Scripture tells us that these men came from the East. How East is up for debate. Historically, the trade route between Jerusalem and Persia by first century AD or first century BC was well used. It was also a route used by troops being deployed by both the Babylonians and by the Persians. And after them, it was Alexander the Great in the fourth century BC, and then the Romans after his army. The Babylonians came in the sixth century BC and conquered Jerusalem and took many of the rich and famous Jews back to Babylon. And Daniel was one of those who lived in Babylon during the time of the exile, and he became a wise man himself. There's always the, the lingering question that maybe Daniel's influence in Babylon spanned the centuries that propelled the Magi to come to Daniel's hometown to, to, to find who Daniel had talked about so many of those centuries before. So, while we're not sure where these guys came from, we do think that it was a long trip. It may have taken them up to two years to make the journey, for we know that Herod decreed that all infant males that were found in the small town of Bethlehem were to be put to the sword. We don't know how long the journey took, but it must each member must have sacrificed a lot to go across the desert in such of a caravan. There is the old African proverb, if you want to travel fast, travel by yourself. But if you want to go far, travel with others. Enough about the guys, how about the gifts? I am convinced that these men, that these magi were men, if they had been women, they would have brought gifts that I think would have been more practical than frankincense and myrrh. But each gift that they did bring had their own place. The three gifts that Matthew lists refers to some inside information that the magi must have had. If they were truly wise men and would have known Jewish culture and that the Messiah would be a king, therefore they brought gold. The Messiah would also have been taken the role of a priest and therefore that would have taken that of incense and in this case, frankincense. Thirdly, it would be inappropriate to bring myrrh as the Messiah would be a suffering servant giving of his life for his people. Myrrh is a spice used in preparation of a body for burial. Another idea of why they brought what they did was because the Magi knew Jewish scriptures. In Psalm 72, verse 15, in, in the 60th chapter of the prophet Isaiah, verse six, we read that visitors from afar will come and visit the Messiah and they will bring gold and incense. So what they brought, at least in two instances, was what they should have been. So they followed proper etiquette. If you were going to visit a Jewish king, this is what you bring. A third idea was that these gifts were common in worship. If you plan to have a worshipful experience, you do not need to go to the temple in Jerusalem, but come to this babe in Bethlehem and worship God. 
the Magi would come and worship because they brought everything they need, gold, incense, and myrrh. God used to live in a building called the temple in Jerusalem, or so the Jewish people thought and were taught. Now God lives in this babe. The fourth idea that the Magi were priests themselves and that these were the elements used in their religion's worship. And so they were showing Jesus of who they were. This might be something similar to what the Apostle Paul experienced in Ephesus, where he meets up with a group of exorcists and magicians. And they are convinced that Paul is the real deal, and they turn in their sorcery books, and they come to believe in Jesus. So maybe that's what's happening here with the Magi, that they see the folly of their own astrological ways, and they are quitting the business and turning in their keys. For they know, know, for they now know that Jesus is the real deal. Really, the only thing we do know for sure is that all three gifts were costly. None of the stuff comes cheap. Their trip, as well as what they gave, all came at a huge sacrifice of time and of money. There's a wonderful story in the 24th chapter of 2 Samuel where God instructs David to buy a parcel of land in which the temple would be built. And when the landowner finds out that the king's, what the king's plans are for the parcel, he offers it to give it to the king for free, for gratis. But the king said, I will never make a sacrifice to God that costs me nothing. The Magi must have had the same attitude. And the next or the last question is, well, what happened to these fellows and their gifts? Again, scripture is silent. We know that the Magi headed back to their home country by a route that they went around Jerusalem, so they did not report back to King Herod. Tradition has it that their remains were gathered by Constantine's mom, Helena, and were taken to the first center of Christianity, Constantinople, which is modern day Istanbul, Turkey. This is just a story. What we do know of the gifts are pretty much the same. We assume that Mary and Joseph came from regular poor Israelite families. A week after Jesus' birth, they were told in a dream that, they, that, that a week after Jesus' birth, they came to Bethlehem where they were to offer the, where they were to offer a sacrifice to the Lord because Jesus was the firstborn. And there they chose the least expensive gift, showing them and to all that they were not rich people. While they were in Bethlehem, they were told in a dream that Herod's henchmen were after Jesus. And so they hightailed it out of town and became refugees, immigrants in the land of Egypt. Tradition has it that these gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh financed their trip to Egypt and later to bring them back safe to Nazareth. Once they established their home there, Joseph and Mary, they had at least six more mouths to feed as their family grew. So the last question is that what does this have to do with us living half away around the world, probably 2,026 years after our Lord's birth? As the first day of the year, there is a chance that we will meet someone new this year. We will make a, a new friend somewhere along the way. It's very possible that you will be the one, the only one who will have the gift that that person needs. Have you ever thought of yourself as a piece in a jigsaw puzzle? Some pieces fit, some don't. 
Some people fit into your life. Well, some other people belong to a different puzzle. There might be someone out there whom you will meet and you are their missing piece to their puzzle. You might provide them with, with meaning and direction and guidance in their lives. And if you see yourself in that way, that makes who you are and what you do valuable and precious in their eyes as well as God's. Or maybe it's the other way around. You are the one that's on the journey and you are looking for that one missing jigsaw puzzle piece. You may find yourself doing something new or doing something that you haven't done in a long time and you're seeking much needed help or maybe a helping hand along your journey. Keep your eyes open. Be open to change and new people that God might put in your life. For they may be magi with the gifts that you need to make your new year memorable. Either way, you are precious in God's eyes because you are that way to me. Happy New Year. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you. We come to you this day of all days with expectations high. We pray for peace in the world. We pray for peace and understanding in our families and in our towns and in our schools. Be with us, O oh Lord. We pray this in your most holy name. Amen. It is the tradition of this church that on the first Sunday of every month, we come together and we have communion. And especially how appropriate it is on the first Sunday of the year that we also do this. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth, that which I have received, I give to you, that on the night of our Lord's arrest, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. He said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he blessed it. And he gave it to his disciples. He said, drink of this, all of you, for the remission of your sins. For as often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Gracious God, we come to you on this first day of the year and we look forward to your guidance again to send us a, a year forward. And we look forward to your presence. Give us, O oh Lord, your grace and your mercy. We pray this in your name, amen.
the last hymn on this first day of the year is Abide With Me. And so as we begin to gather our things up, let us remember and think clearly that at this time of the year, as the church bells peal softly in the distance, that we still need to, to journey to Bethlehem, down a narrow and at down a narrow street to a crude stable where our Savior is wrapped in swaddling clothes. He is the Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords and the Prince of peace. And with reflection upon the state of our world, we pause to give thanks to God for his son and for his life itself. And may the true meaning of Christmas abide with you and yours this day and every day throughout this year. Go in peace.